Uh, welcome everyone to the, the 2022 Lubinsky Memorial Lecture. So it's hosted by the, the Biological Sciences Grad, Associate, Grad Student Association uh, here at the University of Manitoba. So I understand that we have some guests from Guelph and, and Costa Rica as well. So uh, welcome everyone to the seminar. So before we get started, I just want to start with a, a quick territory acknowledgement. So the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Diné peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So a bit about this lecture. So this lecture series was founded uh, by the U of M in memoriam of Dr. George A. Lubinsky. So Dr. Lubinsky was born in uh, Kiev, Ukraine in 1907 and received his first degree from the Faculty of Medicine at uh, Kiev University. He had a distinguished career as a parasitologist, working on parasites in humans, birds, cattle, and uh, other mammals. So he eventually moved to Canada and began research at the U of M in 1960, where he worked for the next 21 years. And he's considered one of the founding uh, members of the former zoology department. Uh, he brought to the U of M a wealth of knowledge and experience, and he had many diverse interests in uh, evolution, astronomy, and even Greek mythology, aside from parasites. So because of his great impact on the university, we hold this annual lecture to hear from leaders in the scientific community from a variety of fields such as parasitology, uh, zoogeography, genetics, behavioral ecology, and others. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Alex Smith, who is from the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of Guelph. And much like this lecture series, uh, Alex brings together a diverse set of fields with his research which includes entomology, parasitology, biodiversity, evolution, and ecology on top of other things, with research composed in both the field and in the lab. So he was born and raised in a small town in Ontario, where he discovered his passion for biology at a young age. He received his uh, bachelor's and master's degrees uh, in biology at Trent University. He completed his PhD at McGill University and now works as an associate professor at the University of Guelph. Uh, he now performs research in many areas of biology, both in Ontario and Costa Rica, which we'll be hearing a bit more about today. And so with that, I'd like to give the floor over to Alex. Thank you, Sean. Can you give me a thumb? Can you guys, can everyone hear me? Hooray. Well, you'll probably have enough of that soon enough. Thank you uh, so much for the invitation uh, to come and to speak with you. This is, uh, I, I love the opportunity to share enthusiasms. Um, and this is an enormous one. This is going to be maybe, I think I just checked the weather and in Winnipeg, it, it's like it, what the weather network is telling me it's minus seven. So there'll be some of this talk that will be warmer, much of it that will be greener. Some of it will be quite hot and browner. And there'll be some lessons that I have learned from the forests and the animals that line volcanoes that reach up from on the Pacific slope of Costa Rica in the northwest of Costa Rica. But I'm jumping ahead of myself, which is going to be a reoccurring theme. Um, so I was talking about this is this is kind of a long title. I figured that the shorter title for this particular talk is listening <clears throat> to the leaf litter. And what kind of lessons the leaf litter is telling us about diversity, about evolution, ecology, physiology, and ultimately about the how the climate crisis is affecting all of those things. Uh, before we go any further, I'm going to acknowledge the fact of where I'm standing, just like Sean did in Winnipeg, and the fact that wherever we're joining, if you're in Canada, you're on traditional unceded lands of First Inuit, uh, First Nations Inuit and Métis, in particular. I'm sitting in Guelph, Ontario, which is on the unceded land of the Between the Lakes Treaty Number no. 3, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, which is part of the dish with one spoon, which is a covenant of Indigenous nations uh, to live peaceably in the territories of the Great Lakes. As with all across Canada on these unceded lands, um, they're home to many First Nations, Inuit and Meti. And taking a moment out at the start of kind of sharing enthusiasms, 
to acknowledge the fact that our research occurs on Indigenous lands, and so it's our responsibility to ensure that our activities respect peoples and lands and to ensure that we listen. I'm also going to take time right at the start to acknowledge the people, the friends that I work with in the area de Conservación Guanacaste in northwestern Costa Rica, without whom the park is not possible. Certainly the research on a smaller scale is not possible, but these are the people, the friends that protect uh, these spaces, these forests, these animals and plants, and for whom, with whom I have the, yeah, the privilege and responsibility of working. So thank you. There's of course, in an academic world, there's all sorts of uh, mentors and people that for whom I acknowledge so much influence, including right off the start, Dan Jensen and Winnie Hawks, and as well as the team of ACG Parataxonomists for collecting, rearing and databasing the ACG insects. And I also want to acknowledge um, the current, the past, I'll even acknowledge the future students of the Smith Lab for sharing enthusiasms, um, for bringing dedication and love of the little things that run the world. And of course, funding agencies, which in a, a tropical research program in Canada, largely is very dependent on the discovery grant structure of the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council. So if I had a cat, I would doff it, doff it right here. Now, seminar, seminar series, um, we're going to share, I'm going I'm to share some of my enthusiasms. I'm going to try and make you enthusiastic about some of these things. So I'm going to ask you to do a couple of things. One of them is, if you've got your phone, if you've got a phone, there's going to be QR codes scattered throughout this. You can use that however you want. They'll, they'll be there to take you to specific examples of videos, of papers, of et cetera's that are around. And in this case, if you're feeling like it's Friday afternoon and you want more than just to sit and listen to the enthusiasms of the balding white guy from Ontario, scan this and you can choose one of six different teams, bingo teams. Get these bingo cards. If I say the words, you mark off the square. If you complete the lines, you know how bingo works, then you win. Uh, if you're a grad student and you win, there are prizes. Well, prizes. And uh, since we're in this helpful Zoom environment, make sure you can locate your annotate tool, which should be like up here somewhere, up here somewhere, because I'm gonna ask you to, uh, we're gonna have some a discussion about some of these things along the way. And now, along the way, where we're going, if everything goes according to plan, is we're gonna talk about three different stories. And one of them is uh, a story in, they're all stories that take place in Guanacaste in Costa Rica. One of them is about documenting the temperature and the, ex for a Canadian, for a temperate ecologist, the incredible and, and beautiful compaction and, and collection of strict abiotic kind of conditions in a very small elevational space. And then we'll switch narratives uh, and some consequences of that with the consequences biologically and consequences uh, with the climate crisis. And then I'll switch gears a little bit and start talking about these little things that run the world, the diversity across the elevation gradient. There's some stories about ants, some stories about staphylinid beetles. And then in the final chapter, if we get there, we'll talk about um, moving biology from the third Rumsfeldian category of the unknown unknowns to the known unknowns and the known knowns, the process of naming biology. Now that Rumsfeldian category uh, referral, reference is probably, I mean, it's 20 years old. I'm dating, well, I, you can see me if your monitor's on, so there's no need for me to tell you that I'm dating myself. But back in June of 2006, this person said this sentence and I'll let you read it because since I'm walking, I have a, a fear of saying the sentence out loud while I'm moving for fear that I would trip over myself. And I'll sum it up. Essentially, the statement was there are the things, and this was with reference to uh, discovering weapons of mass destruction where there weren't any. But his parsing of the world was intriguing to me as a biologist. Essentially, there are the things we know we know, the things we know we don't know, and this dangerous category the things we don't know that we don't know yet. When I heard that press conference, that kind of response to a reporter's questions, I thought, oh my God, what is this guy talking about? 
And it took me a little while to like the slow processing tick, tick, tick of the brain to say, this is, this is biology. This is biology where I work. This is biology across the, the hyper diverse neotropics. There's a species that you know, you know, the species that you know, that you don't know provisionally named things. And there's the vast majority of life that we share our planet with, or that shares their planet with us the species that we don't know, we don't know yet. So that's the root of the unknown unknowns in the title. And this is just a quick look at some of the beautiful species that share this space with us in the ACG. All of these are things that we know we know. There are, remain elements of their beautiful biology to be discovered, but these are taxa that have names and have long histories and are fascinating. There are other vertebrates that we pay very strict attention to, or we ought to. Um, that question, on that photo on the left was me not paying attention to something that I should have paid attention to much earlier. But these are the known knowns and the stories and the lessons that we're talking about today. So involve these things, the little things that run the world that Ed Wilson called. And this is the majority of life, right? This is so most of life is less than a gram, less than a centimeter doesn't see the way the world that the way that we see the world at all. In fact, we call attention to the fact that that expression to, to see meaning to I understand is in fact a statement rife with bias. They smell and taste the world. So the less than a centimeter, less than a gram smellers and tasters are joined. The vast diversity of life are kind of joined under one condition or one other bias from our perspective as biologists. And that is that the vast majority of them are unnamed. And so I'm really excited that in my career and with my students and with my colleagues and friends in Costa Rica that I get to work with these unknown unknowns in Costa Rica. And so these stories this afternoon, uh, the stories will kind of emerge from these incredible groups. Now, in terms of the influence of where some of these questions have come from, a lot of them emerge from this paper that Dan Jansen wrote, Why Mountain Passes Are Higher in the Tropics. So about 50 years ago, Dan laid out the observation of well, the rationale of why we should consider the isolating effect of mountains relative to their climatic stability and not to their absolute elevation. And this publication kind of spawned over the next 50 years a whole subdiscipline of biogeography, essentially, of phylogeography, and now of species discovery and of just writ large biodiversity science. Winnie Hawax took this picture. When I moved to Guelph in 2004, largely it was, the it was for the opportunity to work with these two. And uh, it delights me to no end that that opportunity continues. This is Winnie and Dan in their office in Santa Rosa in Costa Rica and office and office holders that make me smile just seeing this image. So where are we talking about here? So to take, I'm sitting kind of at this arrow here in the upper left-hand corner of the slide. I'm sitting at the upper right-hand arrow and the stories are gonna be down here in Costa Rica. Now, this is a small national park it's roughly about, I looked up, I, I Google told me roughly the, the, the number of hectares in the city of Winnipeg. So this area is about four times the size of Winnipeg, but it's estimated con to contain about two and a half percent of the world's biodiversity. It is a large protected marine area that I haven't called attention to on this slide. That's some of my terrestrial bias. A large protected tropical dry forest, mid elevation tropical rainforest and cloud forest. And one of the reasons for all of that diversity is, as Jensen had observed in this in the paper that we saw earlier from the American naturalist, was climatic stability across elevation long term and, and how that pertains and how that affects uh, one of the consequences to that of the species that are living there. When there's very limited variability, very limited uh, abiotic variation that they experience changes in those absolute uh, values become quite isolating. And so subsequently the dispersal across those changes becomes much less likely. And so you can see here kind of 
with the elevation forced up in this view, some of the some of the range of, of conditions in this. So we're kind of as the plane would bring you in to Liberia's international airport from, uh, I guess you can't fly from Winnipeg, but you can fly there from Calgary and certainly from Toronto. This is the approach view of Orosi, Cacao and Rincon de la Vieja. Now I'm gonna take you inside of these forests for a second to have a look at what we're talking about when we talk about climatic variability, because as Canadians are certainly sitting in Winnipeg where from mosquitoes to minus 40, you have a range, an enormous range of temperature variation. And here's some snapshots. This is a kind of the, the hot, the, the temperatures you're feeling right now as you're standing in this forest at a, in a low elevation on that um, extinct volcan cacao would be about 30, 28 degrees Celsius. They can be hotter, but this is, this is a nice stable forest. Now, when you move up slope, one of the consequences of that, so the forest that we were just in is kind of behind us as we're facing this image, and the, we're going to move up slope into the volcano that's current, that was in this picture, is hiding in that cloud. And this is one of the consequences of this, um, the stability or, or historically, one of, the, one of the consequences of moving upwards in elevation along this gradient is that, let's be calm here with the button, is they're gonna take you into the forest. So you've got the last image, that calm bucolic forest. And then you have this. This is a tougher place to be an arthropod. This is essentially, Dan talks about this as living in a refrigerator. So this is a temperature that could be nine degrees Celsius and is certainly very wet and is permanently wet. This is the cloud forest. And one of the consequences of the climate crisis through time is that with each year, we see less frequent clouds, less rain, higher temperatures, a decrease in the number of days when that the cloud banks cover these volcanoes. So as the clouds rise higher and higher on the mountain and cover the mountain less and less frequently, there's less and less forest in the cloud until the time when there's often today, no clouds on the tops of those mountains at all. This is the same spot as that last video was shot. So a future without clouds for these tropical volcanoes, for these tropical elevation gradients is, is on the horizon. And so one of the questions that we have is what's gonna to happen to the ants, the beetles, and the other smaller leaf litter organisms? We have an idea. There's kind of three things. If you picture as in this cartoon, looking at a, this is Volcanoracy. So there's blue ants representing kind of taxa that are living in the cloud forest at the top of the mountain. These dark colored ants are living in the rainforest at mid elevations. And then the redder ants are living in the dry forest, in the hot, hot dry forest down at the right hand side of the slide. So with the coming climate crisis, that's going to increase average temperature, decrease the predictability of uh, precipitation and alter when in the year it arrives. We imagine kind of three things generally happening. One of them is that the taxa in the cloud forest at the top of the mountain there's gonna be extinction events there. There's nowhere colder and wetter upslope to migrate to. So whether it's based on competition from newly arriving taxa downslope, like these dark and red colored ants, or whether it's because the absence of the cold conditions that they were adapted towards, we're going to lose those cloud forest specialists. We're gonna see migration in between when possible, and we talked about why environmental stability like means it's unlikely, but for some tax, it will be possible to move, to migrate upslope and to track those isotherms. And then we see other extinction at the low elevation dry forest or attrition, where for those taxa that are already living in a hot, hot temperature, there's nowhere hotter, there's, there's taxa, there's, there's nowhere hotter that taxa could have adapted to that hotter condition for them to arrive from. So mountaintop extinctions, low elevation attrition and migration and, and kind of movement in these taxa. So a reshuffling of the decks, of the deck chairs. So that's the context of where we are in the world 
and the bigger context of what's happening while we're there. So one of the first stories that I want to talk about is to show you what that elevational stability looks like today, or at least in the last decade when we've had the opportunity, when I've had the opportunity to measure it. So how does this temperature, other than me insisting to you that it does change very dramatically along this gradient, how does it actually change as you go upslope along this volcano? So for the past, since it's approaching 10 years. So in, in December of 2012, we started deploying these rain gauges and a couple of associated temperature um, gauges and eight different sites across the gradient from the side of the ocean, from the side of the Pacific Ocean, up into the cloud forest at the top of these volcanoes. And then we conducted kind of the relatively silly process of trying to run this electrical equipment in these wet forests for the intervening decade. And we're doing this to take these very small scale, um, micro scale measurements. So temperature measurements every 15 minutes since 2013 or December, 2012. So eight sites, across 1500 meters of elevation. So approximately with the time and the number of sites and the interval, it's approximately 10 million different measurements, which gave me a little bit of pause as I started amassing this data about how I was gonna visualize that. And what I decided to do was to adapt Ed Hawkins climate warming stripes. I'm guessing for everyone that's here, you're familiar with this kind of visual, visualization. So the British scientist Ed Hawkins has created these kind of stripes to indicate each vertical band in his case is a year. And the coloring from dark blue to dark red indicates the departure from the average temperature calculated for some range. And so this is actually for Costa Rica. So you can look at it as kind of this, this stripe or on his website, which is where that uh, QR code takes you in this temperature change kind of uh, warming stripe and also climbing mountain of average temperature. And you can see, so I've been working in ACG basically since uh, things measurably began really go to hell in the, uh, since, since, the, since the early 2000s. Now, I don't have the, the, the analogy. What I like about this, this is an evocative and a powerful visualization. It also is really easy to compress a lot of data into a very simple kind of a one page or a one screen presentation of that data. So in the upper right hand corner, just as a landmark, you see the Hawkins warming stripe. And what we're gonna talk about in the next few minutes is this adaptation of the warming stripes into a warming elevation gradient. So each line here in the bottom represents the daily maximum temperature of a single day at one location. And so from the scaling here within the bar doesn't mean anything, that's just one site. And then each of these colored bars is a day from the 2013 through 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. This is a, I can look at this and I can say, well, this is a dry forest. There's a periodicity to that of heat that is, um, that tells me is evocative of the periodic nature of the dry season in the dry forest. And there it is. So this is um, the malaise trap collecting insects in this dry forest and the temperature data loggers are here. Now in the cloud forest, just as uh, Jansen predicted, there's stability, temporal stability of that temperature. So outside of some abnormally hot days, there's not a lot of variability here. So at high elevation, we're seeing a much more stable temperature. Now, if I take each one of these elevational sites from low elevation dry forest through mid elevation rainforest up to the cloud forest, we can stack them on top of each other and kind of see this uh, silhouette of the mountain in the background and use it to remind you where we're looking. So we have left to right time every day between now and December, going backwards to December 2012, and in elevation going from uh, 10 meters above sea level to 1500 above sea level. And this is mapping those changes in a very space efficient, evocative to me, way of looking at changes in temperature. So you can see the heat in the dry forest, retreating, returning, retreating, returning as the rains turning to blue here in low elevations as the rains return, turning to red as the rains depart. 
And one of the other things you can see, I think, on your screen is kind of the leaking, the chimneying, the piping of hot, those gray and red temperatures that leak upslope in some years and during the dry season. So during the El Nino of 2015 and 16, lots of high temperatures kind of leaking upstream, up, sorry, up, uphill, upslope. So the forests that historically up here would have been practically for all intents and purposes in variant in temperature are having introduced into these systems more variation than they would have observed historically. So this is the daily maximum temperature. If we flip that to the observed daily minimum temperature, we see a different um, effect. We see this kind of mid elevation line, just uh, 700 to 1000 meters where we see forests that really aren't cooling off at night. And then the chimneying effect here is the leaking grays and reds upslope that are showing the, the arrival of that feature of lack of dry, a lack of kind of cooling off at night that is beginning to arrive into these high elevation cloud forests. This is removing temporal escape, microclimates that cold adapted taxa might have to escape the coming crisis. Now this is, so this is all of the data compacted into two different uh, slides. One of the ways that climate scientists look at this across elevation is to calculate a lapse rate. And this is where one of the times I'm gonna get you to pull out your annotation tool, if you would. What I would love to see is here on the left-hand side, we have an axis. I'll read it for you on the bottom in case you can't see it, but it's elevation from zero to 1500 and then the daily average temperature. What would you expect this relationship to show based on the, what the kind of the data that we observed together just there in a second? If you could grab your annotation tool and show me a line or a histogram, however you want to visualize it. Is that tool enabled? That's a great question. Ah. Perhaps Sean, actually, I think I can, can I do it? Sean, are you yeah. able to share the security of allowing annotation? Yeah, let me see. Should be under the shield and a... Okay. That's my fault, Sean. I apologize for not confirming that no, that's, earlier. That's okay. I think everything's checked off here. Now, how about mm -hmm. now? Do you guys are you, are you able to see any annotation tools, folks? Bingo, good. Yeah, because whiteboard is shared. <laughs> Alexandra, I was interpreting the word bingo as meaning you could annotate, but are you saying that you just won bingo? In which case, congratulations. Okay. Yeah, I'm not seeing any annotate tools here. Okay. Can you pass me the hosting for two seconds? Yeah, I can do that. Try, you should see it right now. Show me a heart on the screen if you guys see your annotate tools now, ah, hooray. Okay, so if you're still with me, the challenge such as if you choose to accept it, take a look at that x-axis changing in elevation from low to high, the daily average temperature, what is the, what's the relationship that you would expect? Just the, what kind of relationship would you expect to see there on the left-hand side of the screen over here? Crystal's in, Haley's in, Carl's in, ooh, non-linear, ooh. I love it. So some predictions about non-linearity, but essentially an agreement that we should see a decline, that we should see from hot temperatures at low elevations to colder temperatures at high elevations. And thank you 
Now, don't lose your annotation tool because I'm going to come back to them in a second. That's exactly what we see. This is, this is the actual data. So we see roughly in parallel here, the presentation of the daily minimum, the daily average and the daily maximum increasing at a slightly stronger rate, but declining at a rate of about, uh, the average temperature is about 0.7 degrees Celsius per 100 meters, which just for context for you in terms of how, like we often talk, you're taught often, or you teach yourselves in ecology, in macroecology that that elevation kind of mimics what's happening at latitude this is for per 100 meters in a neotropical volcano a, a change in the average temperature that is reminiscent of changing a degree of latitude now let's focus over here on the right hand side a slightly more esoteric version so what's your estimation of the proportion of each day that'll be spent above the average temperature from the dry forest on the left to the cloud forest over here on the right. So what proportion of each day is gonna be above the average temperature? Prediction for another decline. And more chin scratching. See, oh, Crystal. So I would have probably, before I kind of plotted this out and calculated it, I would have thought, oh, and then I love it. So we have a disagreement. We have some declines, we have an incline, and we have no change across the elevational gradient. Now, I can show you, thank you for annotating. We'll come back to some more of those in a few slides. I'm gonna clear all those. And what I presented here isn't a linear trend but it's a change in kind of average. So we've got colored here, the dry forests, the rainforest sites, and there's some interdigitation here between these at high and low elevations. But in broad strokes, we have dry forest sites that spend less of the day above the average temperature. Rainforest sites that spend slightly more of the day above the average temperature. And then cloud forest sites, the coldest sites, but spend more of that day above the average temperature. And I think kind of sitting back and thinking about that for a second, it probably makes sense that because they're colder and less variant, they are existing near a tipping point where they're more vulnerable to these coming changes because the changes, there's not much variation. There's not much of a change in between the daily maximum and the daily minimum. And so they're existing in more of that day above that average. And Therefore, I would argue there, this is one measure of the sensitivity that they have to the coming change. And as a last kind of invocation about this, we've got the change in elevation here, kind of modeled coarsely on the right-hand side, and an analogous kind of a latitudinal change that you would have to survey to see that kind of so the change in the in the uh, uh, in abiotic conditions across the ACG volcanic elevational gradient is reminiscent of what you would expect to see by moving from jazz to Motown, from New Orleans to Detroit in the United States. So an enormous gradient in a very, very small area. So at the end of this story, we'll just agree that we've got a couple of things here, that we've got stable zones of temperature tightly packed along an elevational gradient and a biological expectation, evolutionary expectation, that through time, that's likely going to be connected to taxa that are quite isolated and not dispersing, not able to disperse across those barriers. And we also have the contemporary observation that the high temperatures, events, or averages are marching up slope. This is the climate crisis as it's being experienced along the volcanoes of the ACG. So the second story is about that the leaf litter has told us that we're going to talk about today is about, well, so that's the context, that's the abiotic conditions, that's the context. What who's living where? And for here, I'm going to talk about two different taxes. Some of them are the ants. Uh, the left-hand side is a, a QR code to one of the first papers that we did about ants along this gradient. And the right-hand side is a more recent paper about staphylin and beetles across this gradient. And these are the unknown unknowns. So this is the tax of, about which we probably have the most to learn. Now, so the ants, which is actually a tax of, about which we know quite a lot, this is um, I, the word cloud 
are genera of ants that live are common across the neotropics. And this is the frequency of taxa of species within those genera within the ACG. So there's a lot of there, there are a lot of species of ants with just within the ACG. There's probably more species of ants in the ACG than there exist. There certainly are more than in, in Canada and approaching what it would be in Canada and the United States combined. Along the elevational gradient, what we found with ants is that we found highest are the highest diversity of ants that we located are in the mid elevations. You can see here and that the ant diversity in the cloud forest is, is lower and also quite phylogenetically specialized. And it's not kind of shown on this graph, but we see what we, the, the genera that we see in the cloud forest tend to be smaller, low, like a small colony size, a smaller individual ant, a darker color and almost more Muppet-like. They kind of, they're bumbling around. So these two genera in particular are specialists of cloud forest, Adelomyrmix and Stenama. Now, across the elevational gradient, one of the things that we found with the ants that we continue to find with other taxa, and this is the first story that, that uh, the ants were the first ones to tell us the story, was that most species are found either at a single elevational band or at kind of an adjacent band or two, and that's it. So I'm going to show you that, the some one kind of plotting of that with this Namtogenes ant. So these are um, a maximum likelihood phylogeny here where each terminal node is a taxon, is a species or a putative species of Namtogenes. And what's gonna appear on the right-hand side is a box plot of the distribution of that taxa across elevation. And so you can see for each one of these taxa, we're finding them in a couple of cases across a wider, maybe a thousand meters, even maybe 500 meters. But in most cases, most of the things that we're finding are at one or two adjacent places. And that's it. Now, those of you who are familiar with working with insects, working in the tropics would be, well, have you just not found them yet? And that's, there, there could be an element of that to this story, because certainly most things we run into, it takes us a long time and a lot of work before we run into them again. But in general, range restriction here is the rule, elevational range restriction. With the Staphylinids, Staphylinids are a, a beautiful group and the sampling protocol that I conduct in the ACG was originally designed to be used with ants, but is essentially a, a standardized sampling regime of the leaf litter. And one of the other dominant groups that we find in, and kind of clearly gorgeous groups that we find in the leaf litter are these Staphylinids. If you don't know Staphylinids, if you don't know uh, rove beetles, they are one of the most diverse groups of insects in the world. There are currently about as many species of this taxon, this family of rove beetles described as there are vertebrates. And I think if we gave the Staphylinid taxonomic community um, meals, uh, resources, and a week, easily the Staphylinids would trump the number, would, would exceed the number of vertebrates and the species in the world. Now, if you locate your annotate tools again, you can even just model what we saw with the ants, but this is a, one of the outcomes of Sarah Dolson's master's thesis from a couple of years ago. But what I'd like you to show me here is what your prediction would be, maybe based on the ants, maybe based on other taxa that you work with, your prediction for how alpha diversity changes across elevation. So the number of taxa, number of species, oh. A couple of hypotheses to mimic what we see with the ants and what we see with many tax. We see this with mammals, with many species of birds, some, um, uh, some flighted uh, mammals like bats. Oh, I just saw, what did I, there was a negative. I think I'm gonna have, I'm having, I'm, I'm imagining things. I thought there was a negative relationship on there, but I loved it. So thank you. And let me pull those off for a second. I'll show you what we actually saw. My what the Staphylinid moment with Sarah, which was this. The diversity just increased monotonically with elevation right up into the cloud forests. The, this was mirrored with abundance as well. <clears throat> that Staphylinids do really well in the cloud forest and that the number of taxa of Staphylinid taxa that we found increased with elevation. <clears throat> 
So this is a very different pattern than we saw with the ants. And I think one of the messages here is that it's, as you can see, it's not the same pattern. And this extends this lack of kind of a, an umbrella taxon for the leaf litter community is unfortunately one of the things is that we see with alpha diversity, many different patterns. We, we see some similarities in patterns of beta diversity of comparison between locations. But we can see, we've seen some taxa like spiders that have very little change across elevation. We see some taxa that in decline, we see the mid elevation hump and we see some that are increasing with the ones that we've, the taxa we've looked at so far. Now, this is a measure of the, the y-axis that I'll get you to label here is uh, beta diversity. Is, is, uh, this is a measure of dissimilarity. So what's your prediction? So the alpha diversity increased into the clouds. So the, pair, the x axis here is not absolute elevation any longer, but it's the pairwise distance in elevation between two sites. And then the phyllo beta diversity is a measure of how dissimilar those sites are. What's your prediction for what we would see across this tropical volcano characterized by stable temperatures? Lots of ups, yeah. I like it, thank you. So what we've got here is a prediction that the dissimilar, we'll have low dissimilarity or high similarity, lots of shared taxa. If you're adjacent and then the farther apart that you are, the fewer and fewer taxa that you share. And if you could all raise your hands and pat yourselves on the back, that is in response to doing good science. That's kind of exactly what we found. And this is a, the beta diversity, this pattern shown here with staphylinids, this mirrors, this, the ants do the same thing. The isopods do the same thing. The spiders do the same thing. Parasitoids do the same thing. We see very little overlap, much specialization. And I'll tie that back into the first narrative that is associated with temporal um, stability in principally in temperature. So the conclusions of this part of the story is that we see mid elevation peaks, linear increases, sometimes no relationship, sometimes a decrease in diversity with elevation, that alpha diversity patterns are esoteric and taxon specific. We can't use any umbrella taxa to see what's going to happen there. But shared amongst all of these taxa is the observation that small distances have large changing effects on the community of taxa that are living there. And generally, if you're interested in the study of beta diversity, what we're seeing is not, um, is not a Russian doll kind of a nesting of diversity, that the high elevation community is not a subset of what's found in the more diverse lower elevation community, that we see replacement. And these are different communities moving upstream, uphill. One other common grouping element to this story is that most of these taxa are taxa that have no names. These are in the Rumsfeldian, that third category of the unknown unknowns. And this is where I'll spend the last remaining seconds with you today, which is to talk about our efforts, our collegial and our, the efforts that we have as a team of researchers within the ACG to name these unknown unknowns. And I'll show you a picture. There's a picture I love. This is Harry Ramirez and I in the Bosque Arenales in Costa Rica, beside this malaise trap, this malaise trap that years earlier had captured uh, some cousins of this particular insect. This is a parasitic wasp this particular parasitic wasp wasn't captured, this, this new species that we described and honoring Harry was captured from uh, a rearing program, an ongoing rearing program to understand, to better understand the defoliating herbivorous uh, larval lepidoptera of the ACG that Dan and Winnie and colleagues have been running for 25 plus years in the ACG. You see with this, very traditional in this slide here, very traditional naming things that we've got the uh, location from the holotype that we know where it came from. We know the elevation that it came from. In this case, we know some of the ecology that it's, we know the taxon that it emerged from it. So it's host species and we know what its host species was eating. We know uh, the um, accessions for the paratypes and we know where they are. 
going to be accessioned eventually into the Canadian National Collection of Insects, Arachnids, and Nematodes in Ottawa. Now, one of the diagnostics here, the diagnostic section in this particular description and those of the other 402 taxa that we described in this paper is principally a DNA sequence. So we have an image and the, and the DNA sequence. And this was part of a paper that we published um, there that you can scan and take a look at a couple of like almost 18 months ago, which was a minimalist description that emphasized for hyperdiverse groups the utility of using DNA to help name the diversity of unknown unknowns in the tropics. Now, this is a initiative what? published in a taxonomic journal and following the rules of the ICN of the, of the naming committee. And it resulted in anger. I'm not sure if this is a particular, like a phone grab of someone actually reading the paper from, the, from some parts of the taxonomic community, but the several different criticisms that have been published of this approach in the intervening 18 months include a lot of uh, non words and phrases that you don't traditionally see within the scientific literature about how this is an elitist and it's exacerbating a problem elitism and it's confusing and it's bogging down and so what i since we're talking about my enthusiasms in this place that is globally important to unesco world heritage preserve what i wanted to do is to call attention to i think shared ground that exists with this paper and this naming this minimalist naming initiative particular to hyperdiverse taxa in the tropics and also call attention <laughs> that although the shark in all 2021 paper has received a lot of attention we've been naming things with dna barcodes for a long time the first one that we're aware of is this ant uh the ant taxa in the acg that we did in 2008 another grad student sarah mierato of uh a grad student of mike's in 2019 had published about the same kind of approach and one of the elements here that i think sometimes gets forgotten in criticisms of this approach is the fact that with tropical parasitoids, there's, there's kind of two overwhelming, globally kind of overwhelming contexts for this. One of them is diversity, the overwhelming diversity of tropical parasitoids, of parasitoid species that exist, the vast majority of which are unknown. What we understand about them is largely from rearing programs, the intimacy, the intimate relationship between parasitoid predator and prey, the larval, the caterpillar, and the tree species that the that the caterpillar is is eating itself it is is and in most taxa we don't know that but that that information is is hidden we know only about the 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 parasitoid we only know know only where it was collected and i'll circle back to that but in the acg we know an extraordinary amount and what we've learned through time in looking at parasitoids in the acg is on average how incredibly host specific they are about 90% of the species plus or minus that we've looked at so far attack only one or two species closely related if more than one species of caterpillar out of more than thousand, the several thousand different species that we've observed. And that I think is one element of this paper that sometimes gets forgotten, which focuses on the, the wisdom of naming things with, with DNA barcodes, because this is in fact for parasitoids, more than naming things with DNA barcodes. This is a naming initiative that has been, it was begun with an ecological observation, supplemented with a DNA observation, and not with a morphological observation. So that makes it non-traditional. And that makes the diagnostic minimalist in that it's not long descriptions of the differences in wing venation or in hairiness but it means it's a diagnostic about a DNA sequence. And in this case, the proportion of these newly described species for which we have the intimate host relationship is enormous, over half of them from the ACG, which is a significant positive departure from what's been portrayed in the literature. Now from the other taxa where we don't have the ones that were collected in malaise traps, this is gonna circle back to the first story and the second story, those isolated, communities framed by the stable temperature divisions 
in aligned and stacked along elevation. So for most of the other taxa, what we've got, we know where they, we know where those malaise traps were set up. You've seen images of those malaise traps of those tent-like structures throughout this talk. So outside of the host, elevation, we would argue, in the tropics is one of the most predictive bits of biology that we would see. So if you take a look on the right-hand side of the screen of this small likelihood phylogeny of one particular subfamily that we worked with in the Sharkey paper, you'll see that, again, most of them are from one elevation. Of the roughly 130 taxa that are arrayed here, about uh, maybe about 13 of them have some range in elevation, but most we find at one place. This is corroborating ecological information that supports the erection of these species hypothesis that we've started with, started with the ecological survey, followed with the DNA. And I guess the last kind of observation to this is there's kind of a paper that Rob Dussel thoughtfully published in the philosophical, I think you can only put philosophical or thoughtful publications in the philosophical transactions. And he made this kind of wheel diagram about the taxonomic circle. And the idea was that historically taxonomists, if they're going to name something, they need to break out of the circle. And so if we say these points within the circle involve kind of differences in DNA, differences in geography, in ecology, reproduction of biology, or morphology, you're going to have to cross the circle between two of those information sources in order to break out of the circle where you're required to describe something new. Now, the difference here in the minimalist naming that Sharkey has spearheaded, that Mike Sharkey has spearheaded, is that we've started from the ecological collection and the intimate knowledge associated with the ecology, the host record or the elevation, and then not the morphology. There is an image of each of these, a high quality image, but essentially we've gone from DNA to morphology. And we recognize that for most of these taxa, they're just are not easy to see, easily communicated morphological discontinuities. But there are DNA discontinuities and there are ecological discontinuities that suggest these ought to be named, that these are valid species. And if they're, or geographical discontinuities. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because of the era that we have created as a species and that we're living through as a people, which is one of depauperation, faunal depauperation. We talked about, uh, the, you've, you've read or some of you uh, are know intimately the, the publication in Science a couple of years ago about the missing 3 billion birds. Why are those birds missing? Almost invariably, it's because their prey is missing, because the insects are leaving, because the insect that across the world, with some exceptions, diversity and abundance of taxa is going down. The other problem is a positive problem historically, and that's of diversity that we've named in the first 10 years of this millennium, there were about 500 species of ichneumonid named per year. And if we waited to describe the potentially 1 million species of ichneumonid that make this planet their home, that suggests that we're not going to be finished naming until the year 4,000. This is a problem because we can't predict what we don't care about. We don't care about what we can't name. So I guess my last survey to you on the way out of this is what are your, do you, yes, I'm gonna simplify a complicated question to a yes and no. Barcodes, DNA barcodes can be useful in species descriptions. If you agree, give me a check mark or a heart on the left. And if you disagree, a mark on the right. Well, look at that. <laughs> we solved it. <laughs> That's lovely. Okay, I'm gonna clear those and I'm going to start making my way towards questions, but it's just, it's, it's a thankful note. It's, it's, this is the last kind of concluding slide about where we just were, which I was just talking about, but these are the stories where we, that I've shared with you, these enthusiasms about temperature and its changes in stable slices that increase diversity across elevation, how that doesn't predict or doesn't result in 
uniform patterns and changes of alpha diversity, but it does uh, result in, in, a, in a uniform pattern of beta diversity, which is things change fast across these small elevational gradients. These hyperdiverse taxa, including specialists in cloud in living in the in the super vulnerable cloud forests, are right up against the brunt of the climate crisis. These cata catastrophic losses in diversity that we must not lose sight of. That we I, I would argue that we can't quibble about the temperature of the fire when it's the house that's on fire. The house, or in this case, the cathedral. So these are diverse, phylogenetically unique. The, com the, the communities, particularly in the cloud forest, will be the ones that are most exposed to the climate crisis. And right now, until we name them, until we can talk about them and have a shared lexicon for talking about them, what will we have lost when the top of the mountain is like the bottom? We don't know. And it's kind of our job to, to know that and to share that. So I started out with this acknowledgement and I'll say it again thank you thank you to all of the people listed thank you to students for and and the funding sources but thank you to you for staying with me uh and sharing some of these enthusiasms and i hope there's uh some questions hey well thank you very much alex for that fantastic talk let's give you a virtual round of applause here <laughs>